your program. The forum will begin shortly. Thank you. John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams, Director of the Institute of Politics at Harvard University. Tonight's forum focuses on Moneyball for Government, a project which encourages governments to increase their use of evidence and data when investing taxpayer dollars. I'd like to thank tonight's forum co-host, the Taubman Center for State and Local Government, the Harvard Business School Social Enterprise Initiative, the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston, and the Ash Center for Democratic Governance. I would also like to welcome to the forum the Ash Center's project on Municipal Innovation Advisory Group. The advisory group is composed of representatives from some of America's largest cities, and we're so proud to have you with us tonight. Our moderator tonight is Nina Easton. She is the senior editor and columnist for Fortune magazine. She covers politics and economics. Easton is a sought after commentator and a panelist and has appeared on Fox News Sunday and other political programs. And something she's doing, which I think many of you will be interested in, is the Smart Woman, Smart Power iTunes podcast series. It's original programming, which is sponsored by the Center for Strategic and International Studies. It's a weekly program and I hope all of you have an opportunity to hear it. She is an author. Her book, Gang of Five Leaders at the Center of the Conservative Ascendancy, has been described as one of the best narrative accounts of the modern conservative movement. Nina Easton was a 2012 Goldsmith Fellow at the Shorenstein Center. And most importantly, she is a former fellow of the Institute of Politics. It gives me great pleasure to in, 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 introduce you. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. So um, we we are thrilled tonight to have two best-selling authors, straight hot off the press, Moneyball for Government. Um, I should also plug right now. You can download download the whole copy. Right. right. Okay. Right. I, pr I don't need to introduce the two gentlemen next to me, but I will anyways. Um, Jim Nessel was, of course, a former uh, member of Congress from Iowa, OMB director, another OMB, and you're with the National Credit Union Association now, mm -hmm. correct, running that. Um, Peter Orzag uh, was a very high profile OMB director uh, at CBO, um, knows his numbers, uh, and is now with Citigroup. Uh, of course, Peter's a, um, a Democrat and worked under Obama, and, uh, and Jim's a Republican. What, what you're going to hear tonight, aside from a lot of numbers and, and analysis and so forth, is a lot of bipartisanship. And having um, just come up from Washington, where I've, I was just telling Maggie I co-wrote a book on the Reagan administration. I'm embarrassed to say that's how, just about how long I've been there, um, except for that glorious year here. Um, and uh, you know, as you know, the, the, the just bitter partisanship continues there. So uh, what's really cool about this book is not only um, these two gentlemen joined together, but you'll see really huge names from both parties coming together on a really important cause. So you guys, you think that the uh, sort of staid budget process in Washington actually has something to do with the Oakland A's circa 2002. <laughs> Peter? <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, the point of this book is that we can do a lot better in bringing analysis and analytics to bear on how we make decisions. And that was the basic, that's sort of where the analogy ends, but um, that was the key to success for the Oakland A's. It is stunning. 30, only 37% of federal managers have had the programs that they oversee, any program I should say, any program they oversee evaluated within the previous five years. Just, just think about that. That means two-thirds of federal managers haven't had their programs evaluated at all, or at least they're not aware of it, uh, over the previous five years. That's amazing. We went through non-defense discretionary spending, which is the part of the budget that's set each year by the Congress outside of the Defense Department. It's outside of Medicare, Medicaid, and the entitlement programs, and tried to identify what share of the spending actually had any evidence backing it 
whatsoever. And our initial estimate was under 1%. We've updated those numbers, and now I'm going to say about 1%. But that means 99 cents on the dollar uh, of non-defense discretionary spending is just kind of on autopilot. We just do it because we've been doing it, and we've got no clue whether it's working or not. That's just amazing. And I think it's amazing for folks in this room to hear, because if you're involved with nonprofits, that sector, certainly results evaluation data has become a central part uh, of that. Um, and Jim, Moneyball, um, talk about why Moneyball and, and uh, follow up on Peter's remarks. Well, so, and Peter's right. I mean, the analogy is, is an interesting one. The, the movie that was very popular, I actually watched it recently again, because uh, it's, a, it's a great movie. It's a fun movie. Um, Are you guys baseball fans, by the way? I am, yeah. I grew up in Lexington and the Boston Red Sox broke my heart so Aww. frequently that I, yeah, I know. But Red Sox and I know, Cubs they're back. Fans, so oh, I mean, that's, oh, I'm a wow. Chicago Cubs fan, okay. so we're still waiting. You yeah. at least got one. <laughs> yeah. um, but the late. analogy, yeah, it could be. The analogy is it kind of ends with, you know, of course, we're not in the dictatorship. You don't have one manager that runs everything and, right. and you don't have one owner that can, can basically make all the decisions. Uh, and so you can't control all the levers. But the point that Peter was just making is that even if you did a little bit more than 1%, you'd be on a better, you'd be on a, a better road. But I do think there are a couple of things that came out of the movie that also uh, bear repeating here, too, that are kind of just principle-level uh, ideas, and that is that uh, if, you're not, if money is not a constraint, you, generally speaking, don't have to be very creative, right? I mean, the more money you have, the more that money is not an object the more you don't have to think about creative ways, you just keep doing it. Uh, and I think sometimes there are some in, uh, uh, that look at Washington and feel like the constraints on the resources uh, um, you know, are not as, you know, we print money, basically. Right. So there, that's the one. We print taxpayer dollars. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so there's that one side, and we can borrow unlimited uh, amounts to add to that. I think the second part is that, um, you know, the more you can introduce information to the gut level decisions, uh, uh, Peter mentioned it from the kind of from the policy manager standpoint, from the political standpoint, I was a congressman for, uh, for 16 years and I can tell you that if 1% was done, 0% was, was accomplished from the political side based on evidence. It was all based on typically special interests, uh, gut level politics, your base, uh, trying to show off for your folks back in your in your home districts, et cetera, et cetera. Politics uh, is uh, is is what really drives that, not really uh, evidence and data. So, uh, so introducing more information, more data, uh, more evidence into this process uh, would inform it in a much more positive way. And interestingly enough, every time it is, every time I have seen that happen, even to policymakers, even to political folks. Uh, it does tend to help them turn a little bit on the direction that policy heads. So that's a huge nut, and I want to get back to that in, in, in a minute, but I want to kind of maybe talk about some of the horror stories. I have my favorite, which is um, job training programs, um, which I wrote about during the recession. We, had, we were spending $18 billion of federal money on job training programs, which the GAO said weren't working. We're in a recession. And what are there, like 40, what is and there were 47 yeah, like of them? Yeah, there's like 40 of them across, I mean, Separate across ones nine agencies. All trying to, yeah. and it's, right. You know, and so, some of them you could, you know, you um, were actually just, they were like babysitting systems for adults. Um, it was just pretty shocking. Yeah, but you say it that way, but so from a politician standpoint, okay, so let's say I go out and I want to cut one of them. Yeah. What are they going to say about me, right? You're I must not care about people who are looking for work. I must not care about retraining. I must not care about the... Uh, uh, lower income, you know, I'm, I don't care because I am, I've gone in and I've challenged it uh, or I've, I've wanted mm -hmm. to cut it. And I think heretofore, uh, because that challenge came without a lot of good basic data behind it, it looked that way. So the more you can also apply information to that and evidence, I think the more it will inform the debate and will help those that want to try and push for changes, push for reform. Peter, what are some other examples? That we, well, yeah. a, actually, the worst examples are where, I mean, you're talking about examples where it just doesn't work. The worst examples are where it's completely counterproductive. So, for example, yeah. um, there's a program called Scared Straight, which some of you may be familiar with, where um, the thought process is if you expose young people to uh, criminals, they will get scared straight and 
um, stay out of trouble. Who came uh, up with that idea? I don't know where their origins were, <laughs> but the, it wasn't me. But yeah. the results show that, uh, unfortunately, if anything, people exposed to that type of information seem to uh, adopt criminal behavior more frequently, not less frequently. Perhaps because people look at that and say, actually, that seems kind of cool, or what have you. I don't know why, but it's completely counterproductive. So you're, the worst situations are where you're spending money, and you're, it's not even just a waste. It is directly counterproductive. The bulk of the uh, problem, though, is where it's just ineffective. And let me make one other point, because I think Jim's exactly right, that when you're in a, a world of abundance, you can afford to not really worry too much about whether things are working. We are, both parties have agreed to uh, caps on both defense and non-defense discretionary spending that I think are going to be extraordinarily hard to, to uh, abide by over time with non-defense discretionary spending next year being lower than it's been in the historical record as a share of the economy since 1962. And by you know, 2022, 2023, we're gonna be significantly below that. In that environment, you can't just dis indiscriminately cut things. There's a, there's a great example involving um, a program called Youth Opportunity Grants, okay? So this was a program that was uh, designed to try to help uh, young people get on a decent career ladder, provide assistance to enter the labor market and what have you before a job training mm -hmm. situation. Um, and an evaluation suggested that it worked very well. It increased uh, uh, college graduation rates and increased, increased uh, earnings and what have you. Here's the problem. The evaluation occurred several years after the program had been eliminated. So if you want a great example of why indiscriminate cutting is a very bad idea as the fiscal constraints become tighter and tighter and tighter, there you go. We can't afford to be propping up programs that don't have evidence and indiscriminately cutting those that, after the fact, turn out to have been great. Well, what was your, both of you, what was your experience at LMB? Did you n notice this? Did you try to apply any kind of evaluation to it? Yeah, so I mean, an example, I'll give you one example, which actually now um, uh, has been eliminated, but it, it took multiple years of effort from uh, the Bush administration and then uh, into the Obama administration. And it involves um, early uh, literacy programs, um, a program called Even Start that is very well intentioned. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to um, help boost uh, literacy among disadvantaged youth. The problem is, again, the evidence suggests it didn't work. The design of the program was not um, consistent with the lofty goals. And that's often the problem that we get in. The, the, you know, Jim said, how can you be against job training? How can you be against literacy for low-income kids? I mean, come on. Of course we're in favor of that. But if you're spending money and it's not working, that means you, you, there's some other intervention that might work that you're not investing in. And that therein lies uh, part of the problem. In any case, after repeated attempts to curtail the funding, we finally have succeeded in the 2011 uh, legislation uh, to eliminate funding for that program. Again, not because anyone objected to the objective, very contrary, just to the results which weren't there. But it, it is hard slog because, first of all, it's hard to go against something that seems so positive. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, you know, the people who are providing those services don't really want to hear that it might not be working that well. And it's rare that um, someone who is on the ground delivering services is I as interested as I, th I think one would hope they would be in actually evaluating whether it's Creating the benefit. There are, there are counterexamples. Well, and they have the year on Capitol Hill, and you can imagine it's a ready made press conference to go out and fight for, you know, even start and literacy programs for, uh, uh, for, for children. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a ready made press conference. So, of course, the demagoguery just flies, not based on evidence, but based on emotion. And uh, emotion is driving a lot of the decisions at this point as a result of there not being those kinds of uh, data uh, driven decisions. And, which is similar to the, uh, my favorite uh, uh, part in the movie, which is really what kind of, uh, you know, kind of put it in, in context for me, is when all the, the coaches, all the old coaches are sitting around the table, if you've seen the movie, and they're, they're making judgments about how good the players are. And, and they're making them all based on, you know, things that it, when you hear them say it, 
as scouts or as coaches, you would think, really, that's how you're making that decision? Uh, you know, how their fastball's coming in or, mm -hmm. you know, if they can handle a ground ball or if they can bunt safely or whatever it is. And uh, it had nothing to do with statistics or on-base percentages. And, and uh, again, it was based on emotion. And I think moving away from the emotion of it helps inform the policymaking process. So let me, just based on taking off on that emotion um, comment, you, it, this is slightly, this isn't quite a what works question, but still it's, it's right, um, right in that alley, which is you've got these programs that are designed to help people, but these programs also can provide a disincentive to, for example, work. And I, I, I think of disability as um, the prime example, um, critics of the growth explosion in disability payments, and, and there have been studies actually out of MIT, right down the street, that show that it does um, create a disincentive to work and that people are effectively ghettoized. Um, they might have a disability that isn't life, it's not a lifelong disability. They could eventually go in the workforce where in fact your, your income would start to go up as opposed to just being on a disability check every month. Right. So how do you, does any of the thinking about this apply to that question? Well, let, let me tackle that. I mean, one of the, so, what Nina's talking about is there's a rule called the substantial gainful activity rule under disability insurance, which basically says, if you're able to work, you can't get disability insurance. So if you go on disability insurance and then you have some job opportunity, you're effectively giving up your disability mm -hmm. insurance and the marginal tax rate on that work is you know, at 100% or, or more. And we should and also add, I think, that the disability is, is, is it's been, the view of it's been expanded um, to include things like, you know, emotional issues, um, mood disorders, and pain mm -hmm. disorders, and so And forth. what's happened over time is that it's, you know, think back to turn of the, uh, you know, 20th century, a disability was like, you know, you right. lost your arm, or it was, it was observable. Right. Um, the majority of cases today are either psychological or things like back pain that are, that are legitimate in some cases, but they're really hard for someone externally to evaluate. And the other thing is, there it's not sort of an on-off switch. There are degrees, you know, my back really hurts, it's uncomfortable to walk, uh, the labor market has deteriorated, and so all of a sudden it's not really worth the effort, and I'm gonna, I've run out of unemployment insurance, I'm going on disability insurance. And one of the biggest risks from this big rise in disability insurance over the past five years is that you know, if you have a 50-year-old who went on disability insurance, the exit rate is under 1%. They're on disability for the rest of their lives. And by the way, this is also why the analysis of a lot of programs are more complicated than people say. So one of the debates involving unemployment insurance was that unemployment insurance gives you an incentive or but it actually kept the unemployment rate up. up right, right. And there are studies that concluded that. But, yeah. here's the big but. If you, if you shut off unemployment insurance and instead people go on disability insurance, then you wind up with a much worse incentive effect because at least under unemployment insurance, one of the conditions is you have to be actively seeking work, whereas under disability insurance, you have to be actively not seeking work. Right. So, uh, one of the, that, but that raises another piece of this, which is often these programs have very complicated interactions mm -hmm. with other federal programs, and it does, I mean, just in fairness, we can be doing a lot better, but it's also the case that often evaluating, you know, doing the evaluation is complicated in part because of all these kind of interlocked different right. programs that are, that are present. And Jim, what about the question? I mean, you know, programs designed to help people, but because of the incentives or motivations they might create, have the unintended consequence of perhaps not being the best answer to their issues. Well, yeah, I mean, again, remember how the program was started in the first place, it was started emotionally and politically. And so it wasn't designed, the design at the front end, so it was wired wrong from the beginning or the incentives were based on certainly all good intentions, not to suggest that they weren't, but if you, if you start with a bad construction or a bad design or a bad wiring, mm -hmm. it's gonna be pretty difficult to, to change that along the way. Um, also, as, as, uh, as Peter said, and this is true, and a lot of, the, a lot of those types of programs that are really meant to help uh, because of the other, you know, impacts uh, that not only other programs have, but changes in technology, uh, depending on where you live in the country, your access to uh, health care, your access to uh, rapid transit. All, I mean, there are all sorts of other impacts uh, that mm -hmm. will affect 
you know, the, the effectiveness of that particular program and whether it's working. I was just going to say, and there's one other, there's one other complication here, which uh, involves sort of at what point you're, you're pulling the trigger or you're evaluating things. A great mm -hmm. example is uh, early education Head Start-like mm. programs. So the early evidence was very encouraging that uh, children that are put into high quality um, preschool programs benefit. And then we, then we w entered an era in which there was sort of a, uh, you know, a letdown because of the fade out effects that basically the evidence suggested that as those kids who were helped in preschool went through regular school, the effects faded. faded. Yeah. And so you, if you had stopped the world at that point, you would have said, mm, not clear this is worth it because the effects are, are, you know, are dissipated. Roll forward a few more years, and there's uh, gathering evidence that, for whatever reason, if you look even later in life, so as those former preschool uh, uh, children enter the workforce and what have you, there are all sorts of benefits in terms of uh, you know, lower teenage pregnancies, increased employment, and what have you, even though you went through this kind of intermediate oh, period right. in which it kind of looked not so good. So one of the other things that we do have to be at least cognizant of mm -hmm. is if you've got a very targeted program that is you know, supposed to help someone get a job, for example, and it's not doing that, that's probably a problem. If you've got um, something, especially er towards the earlier parts of life where there might be dynamic effects that happen over long periods of time, there's at least a caution that we need to kind of make sure we're doing a full analysis and not a partial one. And so the conclusion now is that Head Start does work, even though a couple years ago they were saying it faded out. And it yes, but it actually Head Start, look, I also don't want to get us all too depressed. I mean, Head Start's a great example where I think there's a lot of progress. One of the things that the Obama administration succeeded in doing is t saying, okay, it does seem like there's some benefits to uh, early education. Um, however, there's also a wide variation. All, all of the, uh, not all, but most of the really high quality studies were done with really good high intensity early education programs and not all Head Start programs were like that. So what the Obama administration started doing is basically taking the bottom 10% of Head Start um, programs or centers and, and culling them and, mo and trying to upgrade the whole program over time, which mm -hmm. I think is a, so you can't just say Head Start works because there's tons of different Head Start sure. centers and types right. and what have you. Um, you have to be, focused even within that on improving performance. And but that was controversial when you oh, guys did, I mean, yeah. that was you tough. You talk about, you know, if the Bush administration had done that, forget it. But, but I mean, the fact that you guys took that on was a, was a huge lift. Uh, yeah. But I think a, a lift only you guys could have done, Nixon, I think, Nixon, right? Nixon and China. Right, right, Nixon and China. I think that's right. I and so what right. do you guys, you, you outlined some good um, solutions or at least steps forward in the book. Uh, Talk about that. What should be done at agencies? Well, it's a okay. So first of all, this is not a cookbook. All right, it's it's uh, there's there's nothing in here that that you could say you have to follow this or you have to do this or this is the only way to do it. It's more like a it's it's more like a uh, uh, maybe a travel maybe a travel book. Uh, there are many ways. This is a journey. You're not going to get to perfect. Uh, the journey will never end. It's there's no destination that is you know you can say okay I've been there now I can go back. Um, and there are things along the way that you can look at or should kind of consider as you're traveling uh, through that journey uh, to take into consideration. And, and uh, we've mapped out uh, through, the, through the different authors and through the, um, uh, through the folks at uh, Results for America have outlined, and they're part of your packet that you received uh, if you got this, so I'll, I'll refer to if you have this information. Uh, there are seven of them that are kind of the uh, data points that we're working on right now to try and get everyone to to work on and uh, they they form a, I guess the criteria if you will that we're hoping begin that journey uh, not an end at all but uh, some of the impact points some of the data points along the way some of the best practices um, and in fact uh, we uh, we've seen already some good results uh, that have mm -hmm. happened uh, just uh, just since this book has come out, so. And you and Peter, you, I think it, I don't know if it was Ron Haskins or who it was in here that talked about s specifics like evaluators. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, so I mean, Ron. some of the yeah. let's talk about what some of the things are. So, for example, federal agencies should have a chief evaluation officer that can help the staff 
figure out what the heck does this study mean because a lot of the staff won't really know how or to Or that there even ought to be a study. Or that there ought to right. be a study. Right. So that's something, for example, the Department of Labor has done. One of the, th this kind of ranking here in red and green, one of the things that is evaluated is whether that person exists. Second thing is... And they actually all do now for... For, for the ones the, that are, yeah. Right, for right these here. that are listed here. Um, the second thing is that you should, you should have a clearinghouse like the Department of Education has put together on all the studies that are relevant to what you're doing so that if um, a staffer or whomever wanted to get all the evidence on Head Start, you're not going out and doing Google searches. There's a place you can go yeah. that has them all um, you know, collected, easily searchable, ranked by the strength of the evidence and what have you. And frankly, we have put a lot of federal money into many of these evaluations. They should be not enough, but yeah. um, we, should, we should be gathering them together like the Department of Education has done. Another thing, we talked about um, you know, money being uh, set aside for evaluation. So we propose that basically that you should be doing, for any new spending that you're doing, you should set, set aside a penny on the dollar, 1% of funding, uh, devoted to evaluating the other 99 cents. Simple principle, you're going to start doing something new. Let's at least put in place the structure to make sure it works. So, and there's, there's plenty more, but the point is, there's a lot that we could be doing mm -hmm. to um, bolster the, the money ball for government agenda. But ultimately, I should also say, ultimately, where, it really, where the rubber really hits the road is in the congressional process, and that ultimately is up to all of us as citizens to basically be saying to our members of Congress, this is what we want. We actually want a government that is based on evidence and that is effective and that works and we don't want to be flying blind like we have been. And how much traction is this getting on the Hill? Relative to what? No, I mean. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, is, is anybody question. talking about this? Yeah, um, so, in, in, so in yeah. Party? Paul Ryan and yeah. Patty Murray have co-sponsored. Okay, so Paul Ryan, conservative <laughs> Republican, Patty Murray, liberal Democrat. Correct. Have co-sponsored legislation that would form Yet another commission, but this one I think would be helpful um, <laughs> to uh, to basically promote many of these uh, other stat other measures that we are talking about. So there is progress. I also you mentioned Ron Haskins before. He just came out with a book that um, mm -hmm. documents the momentum that is building in the executive branch for doing much more of this stuff. So yes, all these places that we list there have some form of chief evaluation officer. That wasn't true 10 years ago. Mm. Um, and he, do he documents, and the Head Start uh, uh, culling that I mentioned, or the um, programs in the Department of Education to move towards evidence-based policy making. There, there is action, it's just we're starting from such a low base that a dramatic improvement is still insufficient. And there's a thirst for information and data and evidence that's, uh, you know, that's good and can be actionable. Um, in the Congress. I mean, now you can imagine that there is a lot of information. Uh, so do you trust it? Is, it? is it accurate? Is it good? Is it actionable? All of those are important uh, factors. And is it getting to everybody in a way that's usable? Um, part of that is a process issue. You know, this is, not, this is not the first time these issues have come forward. We were talking about this in the back room that, you know, the Truman Commission, the Grace Commission, the, uh, you know, the, there's been a lot of bills, there's been reinventing government. That was actually the one that I remember the most that kind of had the most traction. Uh, it, it did for me, it was bipartisan, it was the Clinton administration, uh, it was working with the Republican Congress, there was a lot of And I should add, run by, run by Elaine K. Mark, who was, um, used to have an office up here and taught at the Kennedy School. And that, to, yeah. to me, gave a lot of the, the yeah. foundation uh, President Bush came in and, and did something called the PARC program, program analysis rating tool, which tried to kind of figure out a toolbox to, to work on this. And the Obama administration took that and, and ran with it and did a much better job. Um, and now you, I mean, so, so there's a thirst for it, um, but left to their own devices, they sit around like the coaches evaluating players and it's a gut level decision based on politics because it's usually rapid fire and it's usually not something where the information uh, is, uh, is just immediately available. So when it's baked into the process, the way we're asking it to be part of uh, every analysis and every even budget submission, 
uh, and the analysis of the program to begin with, that will help uh, so that it is, uh, it's informed completely as part of it along the way. So as we all know, discretionary spending um, is not the biggest chunk of spending um, in the, the old government spending pie. Um, let's talk about, well, this is discretionary spending, but still def big ticket items. The Defense Department, how are they doing? And then I want to talk about entitlements. Uh, how, how does the Defense Department rank on this? Uh, well, it's, it's really hard to yeah. evaluate the return on most defense spending because you have to be conducting some counterfactual. So what, where people go instead, instead of you know, evaluating the effectiveness of defense spending, is to uh, a more narrow um, kind of operations research type of are we purchasing things as efficiently as we can and the evidence there suggests that in the, the famous you know, $500 hammers and what have right. you, that there are plenty of uh, problems in the procurement process. That's a related but I think kind of distinct question from is the program itself worth it? And there it's just very hard to do the, you know, you're not gonna do a randomized experiment of half of you get defense protection and half of you don't. Good luck. Right. <laughs> But there are ways that, I, there are some incremental ways that that could be baked into uh, some things, I suppose, as, uh, as, uh, as, it, as it begins. But, uh, but no, heretofore, this has, not been, this has not been an area that has had much uh, of yeah. that kind of evaluation. In fact, it doesn't even get an official audit. And then um, there's that big fat part of the pie, which is entitlements. Yes. So entitlement reform, to me, is the most explosive um, politically to do anything about. I got a personal um, feel for what the White House pressure is on the Obama White House. When I wrote a column about reforming entitlements and it seemed like a plain vanilla kind of standard, you know, every, most of us in this room kind of all agree with that, you know, reform entitlements. Um, and I was just spammed with hate mail. Um, you can't touch Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid. Um, <laughs> You just can't to touch mine. Assume. You can touch yours yeah. or, you know, or, or <laughs> that one, but not mine. Um, that's, the, that's the reason. How does this apply to that? <laughs> well, let's talk about the biggest one, which is uh, Medicare. Um, and actually, there's been, uh, just, you know, just to be clear, there's been uh, several years now of very positive developments in terms of uh, very low growth in Medicare. That having been said, I think the evidence is compelling that we waste a lot of money in Medicare, that maybe as much as, as 30 to 40 percent of Medicare spending doesn't improve health outcomes. Now, Give we're an example of that. Um, so the, the best evidence on that comes from uh, several things. One is the massive variation across different parts of the United States. There's been a running debate about whether, so some parts of the U.S. spend two to three times as much uh, for each Medicare beneficiary as other parts with no better outcomes suggests a lot of potential ways. There's been a big debate about whether that's because the patients in those higher spending areas are sicker than the patients in the lower spending areas. And I, 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 I uh, think the most compelling evidence against that proposition was uh, recently done by Amy Finkelstein, who is uh, co-director of j North America, which is also doing great work in this area. And I'll come back to that in a second. But what she did with a co-author is say, let's look at people who move. So you move from a low spending region to a high spending region, or you move from a high spending region to a low spending region, and all of a sudden spending on you jumps, either mm -hmm. up or down, depending on which direction you're moving. So in order for that to make sense on it just being the, how sick the patients are, you'd have to believe that someone who is living in a low spending area who suddenly feels like he or she's about to get sick moves, moves to Florida and vice versa, which right. I don't find plausible. So massive potential savings. Now, the reason that this is difficult is, coming back to the j in North America point, we do not do enough randomized evaluations in how healthcare is actually delivered. That's, that's basically a delivery question. So what uh, Amy and uh, co-authors in a different uh, study found was that something like 80% of the uh, published findings in drugs and devices, so you know a new drug, based on randomized experiments, only 20% of the published findings in healthcare services delivery, like, you know, should we have this kind of hospital or this kind of insurance or what have you, based on randomized control trials. So um, the quality of the evidence that doctors 
deploy in order to figure out whether they should be calling someone up twice a month or four times a month after their discharge from the hospital is much lower than the quality of the evidence for this drug versus that drug. And so we don't know as much as we should, but I think overwhelmingly the evidence suggests there is a lot of spending that could be wrung out of Medicare without harming patient, mm -hmm. patient could health. Could you bake health. utilization into that too? I suppose you could, right? That is utilization, that is. so the point is, Peop, utilization there's of healthcare. There's two sides to it. I mean, the delivery side and access, but also how often you individually, and there are, as I understand it, there are certain regions of the country. It's not just a matter of sickness, is it? It's no, no, also that's it's a point. matter of, yeah, it's, okay. The, doc, the doctors, here's the bottom line. Doctors practice medicine in dramatically different ways depending on which part of the country yeah. you're in, which hospital you're in, and even within hospitals. So yeah. we're in Boston, or, or sorry, we're in Cambridge, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, at Mass General, for example, um, they, they finally did a careful analysis of uh, how doctors were ordering CAT scans and MRIs. Mm. And the doctors were amazed to see that they were practicing medicine in just dramatically, and they just didn't know. They just had never really focused on it, and they, they said, oh, that's interesting. And as a result of that, they also put the doctor's names up on a board in front of the doctors, <laughs> that helped. Um, you, you got a significant reduction in the variation in that outpatient imaging rate. The point is, there is, again, and so Medica, why, Medica, so why are so why aren't why isn't there a bipartisan embrace to do this? I'm going to open this up to questions, so you can start lining up here's the why, microphones here, if you're ready. If yeah. you if you want to get frustrated with Washington, here's here's the deal on this. I think most people believe that in order to get at that problem, we have to make sure that just doing more is not what you get paid for, because then there's no incentive not to do more. So you need to pay for value rather than pay for fee for service, pay for quantity. Mm -hmm. We've been paying for quantity. The big divide in Washington is everyone agrees that that's what we should be doing. The Republicans wanna uh, have a fixed payment per person that goes to an insurance company through Medicare in a premium support of Medicare Advantage. The Democrats want it to go directly to the hospital through an accountable care organization. That is, that's the divide. And the irony is that the, as the world is evolving in this direction anyway, the dividing line between the hospital and the insurance company is getting blurred anyway. Blurred, yeah. And hospitals are becoming insurance companies and insurance companies are trying to acquire providers. So for that to be the sticking point, which mm -hmm. it really is ideolo ideologically, I find kind of interesting. That is fascinating. Okay, on questions, um, you guys know the rules. It has to have, it has to be short, it has to end with a question mark and please <laughs> identify yourself. Sure. Go ahead. Sure, good evening. Uh, my name is Matthew Kennedy, and I'm a National Security Fellow here at the Kennedy School, as well as a U.S. Army officer. I'm also a Boston Red Sox fan. Mm -hmm. So, My question has to do with the national deficit and the enormous national debt that we have right now, which is generally on par with the gross national product. In the context of the medical uh, example that we've heard, I understand the diagnosis leads to prescription. The diagnosis is we spent more than we brought in. What would be your first two steps in that prescription to solve the problem of our national deficit? I could, I could start. I, well, first, you do have to realize things have gotten better. Um, the deficit is under 3% of GDP. Um, the trajectory is much more stable than it was a few years ago. And that's in no small part because of what I mentioned earlier, which is the rate of growth in Medicare spending has fallen dramatically. Last fiscal year, Medicare spending was up 2.8% nominal, which means you take out inflation, you take out beneficiary growth, real per person spending in Medicare fell. What we need to be doing is doubling down on that. There is no, there's, we can do social security reform, we can do this, we can do that. There is no single thing that is gonna change the fiscal trajectory of the United States more than if we can succeed in wringing more of that waste out of healthcare. And to do that, I think we need three things. One is, we need to move away from paying for quantity towards paying for value. We need to further digitize the system because that enables lots of additional changes. And we need to introduce, and we are doing this, but we need to do more of it, introduce more transparency and more consumer awareness of what things cost and what the consequences are. An example which is politically explosive is the fact of the matter is that there are places that require advanced directives. So Gunderson Lutheran Hospital, for example, hospital system in the Midwest. If you're admitted to the hospital, you have to tell them what you want to have happen to you if things go south quickly. That is the ultimate consumer-driven healthcare. And it turns out that without 
being pushed. Are you a death panel? Is that what you're talking about? I'm talking about allowing people to decide whether they want to stay in the hospital or go home. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is about a third of people voluntarily choose that they don't want all this stuff happening to them uh, yeah. in, at the end of life. They want to be able to go home and And be remind with, us how much of health care is spent on those last, that last so the, life is about a quarter of uh, Medicare spending is in the last six months of life. The problem is beforehand you don't know whether it's the last six months or not. So that's yeah. the that's the difficulty. <laughs> yeah. But in any case, what I would be doing is focusing uh, as much energy as possible on building on this positive trend, which we are at some risk of having evaporate because we don't double down on it. We need to be very forceful in all three of those things, and there's nothing else we could do that even comes close, in my opinion. Question up there, sir? Uh, yes, Bill Carlson, uh, previously um, a technology executive, currently retired. Uh, metaphors are wonderful things but they can be fairly misleading. Uh, I love data, I love analysis, but I would argue that government doesn't have a simple win-loss objective function like baseball does. And furthermore, I would argue that most of what government does is to change the rules. Okay. Uh, do you disagree, and if so, why? Thank you. Jim? Uh, I don't know. I think we had a losing year last year in the government, uh, so <laughs> I, I think you can put it on a win-loss record. Going to the question before and adding them together, I think part of it is this breakdown of, of, uh, of legislating, of, of operating the mechanisms of government. Um, I mean, right now, you know, you're, you're no longer a legislator. You're an activist. Um, that, that's what you go to Congress to be. Uh, there are, we, have, we have people running for president that have never passed a bill. And that's, their, that's what they're claiming on their resume is their, uh, and I'm speaking mostly of the Republicans. Um, you know, so uh, actually I'm speaking only of the Republicans when it comes to <laughs> right uh, I think, uh, I think uh, Secretary Clinton actually passed a bill. So no, I, that's part of it. Uh, most of the people on the budget committee today have never passed a budget. Or if they've passed a budget, they've only uh, passed it out of their committee. They haven't passed it through the House to the through the Congress and and gotten the president to. So I mean, all of this is just part of the muscle memory of of doing something deliberate as opposed to, as Peter said, yes, we've had some good years from a, just from a, a a numbers standpoint, but it wasn't because it was necessarily deliberate. It was more because of it of a default uh, and uh, some mechanisms that happened automatically not because of good planning and necessarily good leadership, so. Okay, great. We, I'm just gonna move because we have great. so many questions. Sorry, Peter. That's all right. Hi, my name is Maya Giacomoitz. I'm the policy director with the city of Philadelphia and I'm hoping that you can talk a little bit about how this conversation then trans, translates to the state and local level in particular because I think that's where a lot of the service provision ends up happening um, and Unfortunately, unlike the federal government, we're not able to print money when we feel constrained. So I feel like the, the onus is on us to really perform above and beyond in the work of evaluation. Are, it, are state localities better at this than the federal government? There's a lot more activity going on in this area at the state and local level. Um, everything from social impact bonds to Centers for Economic Opportunity, which is uh, uh, you know, a New York City thing that is that evaluates programs. Uh, I'll put in a little advertisement for my employer, which uh, this, the foundation at Citigroup is working with um, some of the folks here on um, spreading some of those best practices. So it, it's more exciting, uh, frankly, at the state and local level because stuff is happening mm -hmm. than, uh, ne than it is at the federal level. And I just say, uh, again, there, there's a lot that you can do from, um, much of uh, you know, learning from other cities, the Bloomberg folks are promoting. I mean, there, there's a lot of kind of energy in this space, in part because you're on the ground and you know it matters and you've got to deliver results. We just announced today that the mayor of Boston has become a, a Moneyball a super, superstar, I think. Oh. All-star, that's the word. Awesome. Superstar too, why not? Let's make that the yeah. moniker. But so yes, we're working with, with cities and states on this, and Peter's right, it, some of the best Best activity is, is happening at the localities. Right over here. I'm Ben Lerner, senior faculty here at the Kennedy School. And among other things, I teach evidence-based decision making. So uh -oh. Uh -oh. Um, I wonder if you could comment on 
what you think is necessary in terms of building up the human capital from an education perspective till we have a government that is really knowledgeable in how to evaluate evidence, what the differences are between a correlational design and a randomized field experiment in terms of the conclusions you can draw from it. Because we find when we're teaching everyone from undergraduates on up to senior executives in government and military that uh, there hasn't really been a core piece of training that focuses on understanding methodology and the causal conclusions one can draw from different methods, uh, very little on statistical training. Yep. And so what do you think we need to do here at the Kennedy School to help uh, provide the educational basis for a money ball government? Great so question. Go ahead. I Peter's chomping at I, the yeah, bit. Here I feel I, I'm, I, I'm kind of, I'm very uh, energized about this. I think it has to start well before students get to the Kennedy School. Mm -hmm. And the way that we teach uh, elementary school students, it needs to be dramatically revamped. I mm -hmm. really don't care if my kids know trigonometry. I want them to know probability and statistics because uh, the skills that they're going to need uh, later in life, it's very unlikely that they're going to become engineers. Um, well, maybe, but they, whatever, whatever walk of life they're, they're going into, they're going to need probability and statistics. We have not, in general, That's revamped the elementary school curriculum for the 21st century, and we need to do that urgently, or else all the kids that are showing up later yep. at the Kennedy School have missed 10 years of training that, that would have made mm -hmm. your job a lot easier. That's not a full answer, because then the question becomes, what do you, and I don't know what to say other than to advertise that there should be more students who are required to take your class. But uh, <laughs> it's, again, I think we need to start earlier, and then uh, once, I don't know what the requirements are here, but there should, but basically no one should graduate from a public policy school um, with a master's or, or other advanced degree without a requirement that they take at least beginning probability and statistics and some form of evalu evaluation because you are not going to be able to function well in any policy position without being able to, you don't have to be able to conduct the research, but you better be able to interpret it yourself. Thank you. Fascinating. So. Dorothy, my name is Dorothy Stoneman and I am an advocate for one of those job training programs. Uh, happens to be one of the three named in the Moneyball for Government book as a good investment. Oh, good. good. <laughs> right. Which is the Things we're about to get really no. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Department of Labor yeah. Youth Build program, yep. which you both funded and which under Mr. Orzag doubled in funding. Show off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> However, the question is this. At the beginning, you, s you talked about two problems. One, uh, which is... Uh, ineffective programs being continued and the other damaging programs being continued. My challenge is how do you take effective programs and make sure that they are in fact expanded to full scale to solve the problem which they're designed to solve. And that's very difficult because the government works in incremental ways and it tends to stay stuck mm -hmm. even when something is working. And, uh, and I want to say a little something else to a second question. So one question is how do you do that? How do you identify these and take them really to full scale, which I define as reaching the limit of demand or capacity? Um, and the other is the difference between RCT and data outcome, mm -hmm. right? It seems to me that the ongoing accountability for achieving outcomes is just as important as your random control trials, especially since the results of the random control trials don't come for eight years and by that time, there's a lot of change on the ground, and you need to be tracking how are they doing on those outcomes. Yep. So I would like to I'll know it, about both of Let me both do it briefly those. from the congressional side. And yep. This used to be where a lot of those kinds of good ideas would come up through the subcommittee process to the committee and on to the floor and, and so forth. And, and as a result, that was an entry point where a, where a good senator or congressman could highlight an idea that was coming from their constituents. Maybe it was a, uh, a, a private uh, funded idea that, that came up 
or maybe it was public-private, or maybe it started the states or at the locales. But regardless, it was that was the germination process, the laboratories coming from from those areas. But uh, the 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 uh, that process, along with the budget process, is quite broken now. In major part, I think because of the election uh, process and uh, and uh, special interests and fundraising and all of the distractions that have taken away from what we refer to as the regular order of the of the legislative process and then the second is making sure that that the states uh, and the uh, cities in particular which are the true incubators for that can get those ideas uh, to their legislative uh, delegations and that's another that's another point of connection that uh, again has been has been disconnected in part because of partisanship so if you're a republican legislator and you have a democratic governor uh, or your senator, or whatever, uh, you know, you're, you're concerned about them running against you or whatever, and so you, you don't even take good ideas like that through the laboratory process. So I would say that's certainly one area that is broken, where that would have been a great access point uh, just through the political and congressional legislative process. I think advocates of effective programs should be the most forceful in trying to back up the effort to cut back the ones that don't work because it mm. frees up. I know it's hard, Very but hard. it makes sure. the That's politics a, a lot easier That's to say, question. I am in favor of job training. Yeah. I just, here's the one that works and these other ones don't. And to have people in the field and kind of uh, out there doing it, supporting that frees up the money to expand. You're not going to get to scale sure. while you're carrying this load of ineffective programs on your back. It's not going to happen because there's just not enough room in, in a declining non-defense discretionary spending environment. What has to happen is that we cull the stuff that doesn't work to make room for growth. And then on the RCT question, one of the great ironies is we are living in a world in which it's increasingly easy to collect data, analyze it, and have it available in real time. And so the, we, in the book, we talk about different kind of degrees of evidence. and. I am fully of the view that not everything should be RCTs and we have to have a spectrum of evidence and we should be um, much more aggressive in trying to take advantage of the reduced data uh, acquisition costs and processing costs to have a much more rapid feedback loop on what's working and what's not. Thank you very much. Marianne Bates, uh, Deputy Director of JP. My question is Deputy for of of J-PAL North America. Um, my question is there are many people within academia and at research firms that spend their careers doing this kind of work and doing these evaluations. What can we do to make sure that those results better reach decision makers in a salient way so that they can act on it? Wow. I don't, I, I'm not sure that, uh, because this is, that we are, guys. yeah, yeah they're, I mean. They're, that's seriously, they, what, they're, Certainly, you guys are that's the ones that are supposed to put these. That's that together. access point that we're trying to create through yeah. all of this. But you're you're right, and it is terribly frustrating that, uh, as Peter was just saying, you know, we have access to so much information. How do you how do you ensure that it's quality information, and how do you get through the noise? Uh, is uh, is a terribly vexing challenge. That uh, this is not the only. Uh, subject or organization uh, that uh, that is trying to crack that nut. I would like I, to go. Uh, sorry, sorry. After, I wanted to do have you guys interject. Is there a uh, you know your organization? Is there a way to get feed these ideas better? Sorry, Peter. Hi, my name is uh, David Medina, and I'm with Results for America. We're a three-year-old nonprofit organization, and our mission is to. Uh, work with local, state, and government leaders to help uh, drive uh, funds towards evidence-based solutions. So exactly what you're talking about. We've done it in a lot of creative ways. We've built a bipartisan coalition of nonprofit leaders, current and former uh, executive branch leaders. We've done Twitter town halls. We've done animated videos to try to build support uh, among the general public. We published this Moneyball for Government book with our uh, two great editors. Um, I would recommend for all of you, before you leave, if you can pick up a copy of the index that's been referred to, uh, it's our scorecard of how federal departments and agencies are doing. Secondly, I also want to highlight that we also released today our 2016 policy playbook, which is an agenda for the next uh, president and how they uh, can build an administration focused on data, evidence, and evaluation. So right. results for America.org.
Peter? I was just going to say, I, I actually would say to the researchers, uh, spend your time doing the research and lean on uh, groups like this and then the rise of analytical journalism. So there are now increasingly from the um, upshot at the New York Times to the Ezra Klein to Vox.com, there are lots of places that are eager for rigorous analytics point, yeah. that they want to then adopt and broadcast to the world. So feed that a bit, but don't, I, I don't think it's a good use of a first class kind of researcher's time to be doing the lead work of trying to convince members of Congress. Lean on the other people who do that for in you know, other words, full time. I, I would say find a megaphone. Exactly. The press the these these guys right. in exactly. the you know like Ezra Klein's of the media world. You guys you know that sort of thing versus going one by one to members of Congress. But even we sit around and frustrate about you know how can we get our voice, which is part of the reason why we're trying to access that through the political process. If we can make this uh, something that's interesting to the next administration, the next president. Uh, that's that's huge. That's huge, and it's clear that both with Bush and Obama, that uh, and with President Clinton, that that was uh, that was a priority, and you could tell by the the way they all took that forward. Great. Next question. Hello, my name is Lisa Goldman. I'm a management consultant, and my question actually uh, falls very nicely uh, from the question that was just asked. You're talking about putting research into practice, and the best ways to do that. And I'm wondering, do you think it would be possible? Uh, given that the federal government funds or partially funds so much research that happens in this country, what do you think of the idea of requiring all recipients of federal funds to report their findings back to some kind of centralized clearinghouse like what you talked about uh, the Department of Education doing? Um, that would then be a, a central uh, location for not just federal employees, but people in Congress, citizens, we need citizens to be better educated, so our politicians can't, uh, will be more forced to tell us the truth. Um, what do you think about the idea of collecting the information? And you could even say, here's how this study was performed, here's who evaluated it, you know, here you could have a meter about how, how truthful you think it is or whatever. What do you think of that as a concept? Isn't this sort of what the GAO and the CBO are already mm. supposed to be doing? Are we talking GAO no. more than CBO? The GAO. Yeah, I but I, I don't think the problem is that federally financed research is not in the public domain or yeah. accessible. It's, it's just all over the place. And if you just required people to dump it into a, a clearinghouse somewhere, I, this is why I come back to, I think it's the responsibility of the sponsoring agency and or the um, oversight agency in, in, you know, that the Department of Labor, Department of Education, to take that publicly available information, which is out there, it's just hard to find, and curate and collect it into a, the type of clearinghouse that exists. I mean, the Department of Education has shown you can do this and you can do it pretty well. Their, their, their clearinghouse, I think, is actually top notch. So um, we agree on the, on the goal, which is basically all federally financed research, and I would go beyond that, all publicly available research should be in a database that is uh, easily searchable with um, you know, the relevant domain and the rigor of the evidence and what have you. The only question is, uh, I guess, is it the researcher who's putting it in there or is there some other way to do it? But we agree on the goal, I think. Can you talk closer to the mic? Uh, Christopher Scranton with the Mass Big Data Initiative. Um, we've talked actually, Billy, on the last question about this uh, future, and some would say the future is now, of being awash in all of this data that's supposedly helpful. Um, there is a data overload question that is sort of obvious thing to uh, challenge to uh, address. <coughs> Do you have a, a, a perspective on the role of analytics, advanced analytics, machine learning, any kinds of the, the cutting edge ways we use to, to sift this data to get insights and outcomes? Have you, have you thought about a layer above the layer of data? So I think um, coming back to the earlier question about um, using non-randomized control trials and outcome uh, data, we can be doing a lot 
better. And there's, uh, there's a lot more energy in this. Um, so for example, I'm on the board of a, a set of schools in New York called New Visions. Um, and they, are, they have built a first class data warehouse where um, it is using big data analytics to basically say, if this kid winds up doing poorly on this test, what does that then imply for the rest of the year? And do we need to be intervening more aggressively? So there's, and that's just one example, but there is lots that we can be doing. This also raises another point, which I think deserves uh, increased attention, which is um, there are lots and lots of compre quasi comprehensive private data sources that are publicly available that need to be combined with the traditional government surveys and government administrative data in order to get better real-time uh, analyses. Um, as an example, in healthcare, which we were talking about before, the official data are so lagged and so um, untimely that you can do a lot better by gathering private sector data together to get a real-time source of information. That nexus of how we combine official data with unofficial data and the biases that might be created from unofficial data and what have you, that, need, that is uh, very important if we're gonna take advantage of the explosion in big data, and we're not very far along in tackling that question. So that is something the Defense Department is better at and is ahead, but we, it sounds like we should ask you uh, your opinion on that. Maybe we'll get to that afterwards. Question over here. My name is Dan Florio. I'm a mid-career student at the Kennedy School, and um, I'm very interested in, in this topic. Um, my one concern is how this approach could have problems with outliers. Because we're talking about here, you know, g government services, it's different than baseball in that sense. Um, you know, if there's someone who, I mean, if, they, if there's a program or practice it, that works poorly overall, it could have a dramatically positive effect on particular subgroups of people. Um, and I guess if you can just address that. So I, this is one of the complications in um, in any government in any government program, which is uh, they're often even when the evaluations are done, they're done on average, not you know pulling out sub parts of the population. As the data revolution continues, it might become easier to do that. It's not that's only a partial solution, but there are going to be situations in which the average effect is zero or negative, and some people benefit. And then we as a society have to ask the question, um, if, you, if you look at the dollar spent per effective person then, it's gonna be astronomically high. What's an example of that? Uh, you know, there, there may be some people that do benefit from the ineffective job, uh, job training programs. Or um, healthcare provides another example. I talked about all this waste from the variation. Well, there are gonna be, you know, one out of 50 people who will benefit from that much more intense approach in Florida than in Minnesota, and if you cut back on the, Flor the Florida approaches, you know, it, for 49 people there's no harm, but for one person or for, uh, there, there are gonna be people who are hurt. And I, th I think then you have to come back to this question of we are living in a world of limited resources, and you inevitably uh, are gonna wind up, if you're, if you're spending money on 49 people ineffectively and one person is being helped, you're inevitably going to wind up not doing as much, even for that one person, as if you could better target. And I, I, it's not a full answer because there is no full answer. Um, this is one of the inherent. I would say, when you evaluate what kind of evidence you use and what level of aggregation you use to do the analysis, those are all very difficult questions, which is why this is not an easy thing to do. But it also assumes that that one outlier that that you know would be harmed by the the elimination of that program couldn't be helped by any of the other 16 programs. Uh, that probably isn't correct either. Uh, so that there would be a transition, there are transition issues certainly to all of that. But, uh, and it is something we should concern ourselves with. But we're not talking about, as Peter said to start with, this is not an on and off switch. It's not all about data or all about emotion. Uh, it's just more about data, less about emotion. Um, and I think if you combine it, you're still going to have human judgment in all of this, uh, in the decision to fund a program, the decision to launch a program, to continue a program, uh, or to eliminate a program. There's gonna be politics involved in all of that. So data just hopefully inform, make, gives everybody, particularly the policymakers and us as constituents, 
uh, the better uh, information about the judgments that we need to make in a, in a, in a constrained uh, resource world uh, with a very diverse population and challenges and needs. We're out of time, but if you make your question, you're asking a question? I have a very crisp question, I think. If you make it real quick, we'll get it in. Okay. okay. Um, it's good news, certainly, that uh, the deficit is coming down. I think everybody's happy about that. Some are starting to talk now about balanced budget, which doesn't make any sense to me. Why is no one talking about budget surpluses, where we have more revenue than money that we're paying out at the federal level? I'll start by just saying, to me, I've always been perplexed by the balanced budget because it, it is a... It's a data point along the way uh, that you are balanced or not balanced. It's still an equation, and it's a math problem. You know, it, 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 has, it does not discuss or determine whether or not you have the right level of spending in any particular program, whether you have the right priorities, uh, you know, whether you're growing as, as an economy, whether you're serving uh, people who have needs. And so a balanced budget is, uh, and I can tell you this from the last time we got to a surplus, I was part of the team that got us there, and uh, it didn't feel any better the day after than it did the day before. Uh, and in fact, it caused a complete change in the attitude of politicians. They said, "Great, let's start spending money," you know, yeah. and which was not necessarily the right thing to you. You could argue. So, it's to me, I've always been perplexed by. So, are my for a balanced budget? This is again the emotion. Of course, I'm for a balanced budget. That's what you say on the stump. Truthfully, it's a, it's a data point along the way, and it doesn't necessarily suggest we have the right government um, or, or a good government or a successful government or a winning season, as somebody asked uh, earlier in the Moneyball context. Peter? Well, I'm going to be a little bit of an outlier here. I think what we should be doing is doubling down on stuff that will make the debt and deficit in 2030 a lot lower, but frankly, when the... 10-year Treasury yield is well below 2%, and I'm flying back into Newark or LaGuardia, I don't even know where I'm flying tonight, um, and, and the state of those airports, as an example, uh, th those two things should not coexist. As Larry Summers has said, I agree with him on that point. So my own perspective is, we could, if anything, I would rather see a larger deficit over the next year or two to address infrastructure problems, coupled with a lot, a lot more emphasis on deficit reduction in 2030, which really comes back to the healthcare question that we were talking about before. And Peter, I'm glad you brought that up because I've been wanting to get infrastructure in. I mean, that is the one place, except go. for the far right of your party, um, that there's tremendous agreement that, um, that that's a worthy investment and something that will actually contribute to economic growth. You both have been incredibly thought-provoking, and this has been such a high-level audience, too. It's been really um, a treat for us and an honor for us to be here. Thank you both Thank so you. much. Thank you.